Hello and welcome to Analysis with me, John Rees. The crisis in Iraq could not be more serious. The Iraqi state is imploding and across the region, national frontiers established at the end of the First World War could be about to disappear. Iran is now involved alongside fellow Shia volunteers fighting predominantly Sunni rebel groups and forces from the Islamic State of Iraq and Levant. They have captured large areas of the north of the country. The Kurdish area is now, in effect, independent. So who's to blame? President Obama blames Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki. Tony Blair says the West should have bombed Syria. Paul Bremner, the first U.S. governor of post-war Iraq, says the U.S. should have occupied for longer. But many others say Western intervention has exacerbated sectarian divisions that are now being played out in both Syria and Iraq. In the studio with me to discuss these questions are Chris Nynam from the Stop the War Coalition, Dr Sabah al Mukta from the Arab Lawyers Association and Paul Schult from King's College London. On the line from Iraq, we've got Professor Fikrit Terzi from the College of Technology in Kirkuk and joining us on Skype is Anne Hapgood, who's a PhD candidate at King's College London. Welcome to you all, but first, let's look at this video report. Following the seizure of Mosul in northern Iraq last Wednesday, the Republic has once again descended into political turmoil, a situation many fear might mutate into an outright bloodbath. The latest incursions, led by the Islamic State of Iraq and the Levant, have sparked a new exodus of at least 500,000 Iraqis who fled across the Tigris River in search of refuge in neighbouring Garbil and Kirkuk. The political storm has wreaked havoc not only in Mosul, here are images of militants taking over abandoned U.S. military bases located in Tikrit, the previous stronghold of deceased President Saddam Hussein. Extremist fighters have taken over Tikrit, Fallujah, surrounding cities belonging to the Nineveh province and Beji, home to Iraq's largest oil refinery. Sources have told Al Jazeera that ISIS gunmen erected checkpoints around Tikrit, obstructing entry into Mosul and routes leading towards the capital, Baghdad. But since power was handed over to the armed forces of the semi-autonomous Kurdish regional government by army personnel who'd abandoned their posts, Kirkuk remains firmly in the hands of Kurdish forces. Despite the Prime Minister's attempt to declare a state of emergency, Nouri al-Maliki failed to secure the votes needed to implement emergency measures. Officials from Nouri al-Maliki's state of law coalition purport that the government are regaining fallen territories through counterinsurgency operations, enabling some of those Iraqis who initially fled from their homes to return back safely. Our security forces have regained the initiative to launch qualitative operations on various fronts over the past three days and have achieved remarkable victories with the help of volunteers. But within the present climate of injustice, ISIL have rampantly mustered on the ground support from Sunni tribal leaders dissatisfied with the rule of Iraq's incumbent Prime Minister. Meanwhile, the effects of the recent carnage continue to ripple outwards across territories where ISIL's operational presence is on the rise in both Iraq and Syria. Baghdad is 100% safe. The command of Baghdad operations is carrying out its duties with the support of all parts of the interior and defense ministries, be it the surroundings or the heart of Baghdad. Whilst the status of Baghdad remains ambiguous, statesmen continue to reassure residents that Baghdad is protected from the threat ISIL poses to the country at large. For those soldiers that abandoned their ranks during the confrontations in Mosul, President Nouri al-Mali accuses them of conspiracy and collaboration, issuing warnings that those crimes of those we capture will not go unpunished. Calls articulated by revered Shia cleric Ayatollah Ali Sistani echo those of the Prime Minister, both men encouraging civilians to take up arms and fight until the bitter end. After a Sistani's religious sermon address only three days ago, volunteers were mobilised in less than a day. Thousands of Shiaris described as volunteer Iraqis have responded to these calls by promising to protect holy sites situated in Shiari inhabited areas from Sunni zealots. Some reiterating that their homelands are dearer to them than blood. But as the rhetoric communicated by all side continues to mythologize the Sunni Shia divide, Maliki remains insistent in his claims that there is no sectarian battle facing the country. 
President of the United States, Barack Obama, has expressed dismay at the government's mishandling of the situation, whilst tacitly stating we can't do it for them. Obama's words have seemingly reverberated across media headlines, warning the world of the threat ISIL poses to the wider Middle Eastern region and America more directly. Back in London, former British Prime Minister Tony Blair similarly overlooked true causes behind Iraq's simmering and foreboding situation. In an interview with BBC's Andrew Marr, Blair stated, even if you left Saddam in place in 2003, then when 2011 happened and you had the Arab revolutions, you would still have had a major problem in Iraq. Against the backdrop of intense dissatisfaction with Iraq's Shia-led government, the death toll of ordinary civilians continues to rise. But what will happen to this country whose cultural heritage has already been shattered and marred by blood? And what exactly is needed to restore the country back to stability? Or has Iraq touched bottom? Will a three-way divide be what it takes to restore peace? Nazli Tazi, Islam Channel. So, Sabah, uh, let's just concentrate on what we think is actually happening in Iraq for the moment. Um, we'll come on to the wider, the wider questions. This is clearly not just uh, some thousands of fighters from ISIS. There's clearly a, uh, a Sunni rebellion going on at the same time, isn't there? Yes, certainly. This is, the, this is the uprising which began a year ago, initially for a whole year, more than a year. For a whole year, it was a peaceful one. Then Maliki decided to use his troops when we had the massacre in, in Hawija and Fallujah and Mosul, uh, to the extent that a lot of the people who wanted to uprise, obviously, there are the terrorist organizations like ISIS and like other organizations. People don't want to join these forces. So at the end of the day, they gather together. There are senior officials, senior officers of the previous army, generals and, and uh, marshals, who have now in control of each governorate of Iraq, the 18th, they have what's called the military council. The military council is made up of the people of that uh, governorate, led by military officers from the Iraqi army. They are the people who have overrun uh, Ramadi, Fallujah, Mosul, Tikrit, and all the rest, and they are heading toward Baghdad. Uh, they are being supported by the population, but certainly there are elements of the, of the ISIS. But the problem is that the West is, and the media is portraying it, it's ISIS. And ISIS, in fact, even the widest estimate, they are not more than a thousand people. While the other people, the, the military councils, they are in tens of thousands because they are in all the governors. The ISIS could not overrun all these areas. You have an army there which is 80,000 people, highly trained, uh, uh, billions of dollars were spent by the Americans. They've abandoned their airplanes, they've abandoned tanks, cannons, uh, ammunition. So this is really an uprising. The West needs not to repeat the problem. They need not to repeat the mistake they've made. So far, they've been acting on one side, supporting Maliki, because he's our man. He's the man that we put there. Good. Paul, I mean, do, do, you, do you broadly share that, that analysis, or do you think Partially, that... Partly, I think ISIS is bigger. The, the, the estimates I've seen are around 7,000. And it has provided um, a suicidally effective spearhead. The, those other factors that I mentioned, the Sunni disillusionment, the fact that ISIS had been benefiting from sympathy in Mosul for months, collecting revolutionary ta uh, taxes, unmolested by an ineffective police and army from the Iraqi state. All of those helped, but without the ability of ISIS to project a fighting force out of Syria, the, uh, you know, the critical factor that it's got a rear operating base around uh, Razak and uh, eastern Syria, that's, that's made an enormous difference. But there is no doubt that Sunni disillusion is widespread and um, important. Without that, ISIS wouldn't have achieved what, it, what its offensive punch has enabled it to achieve. Mm. Chris, is that how you see it? I mean, obviously, there is a, a deep discontent with the um, sectarianism of the government, uh, as well as uh, a government that isn't really functioning, isn't it really delivering basic services and a basic infrastructure for people. And it's clear that there's no way that um, these kind of military breakthroughs could have been made without support uh, from the population. Now, having said that, I think at the same time, um, the country's heading further and further into a kind of sectarian split, and that's not good news. It's a, it's a further result. Um, it's one more catastrophe uh, that is a result of the, uh, of, of the occupation, of the trauma of the invasion of occupation that took place 
um, 11 years ago. Mm. And let me bring you into discussion here. Um, it, it's a bit rich, really, of, of Obama to blame the Maliki government because um, uh, they were the people that started it out down this path in the first place of sort of non-inclusivity, shall we say, at the, uh, to put a nice title on it. Uh, I think Obama is refusing to take any military action. It wouldn't be well supported uh, by the population on the ground. So somehow it's uh, on while he's deciding on what policy to take or what course of action to take, it's getting him time by reporting the fault uh, on, uh, on Maliki. But in the same time, yes, the Americans decided that the power sharing system was going to be set in place. Would have the being able to anticipate that it would have worked along ethno-sectarian divide as it became today, it's difficult. I mean, I think when they chose Maliki as a prime minister figure, there was no way to anticipate that he would become uh, an extremely polarizing figure, not just among sectarian groups, but among his own sect. He's a very divisive figure among the Shiite as well. Okay, uh, Professor Terzi, let me bring you in. You're 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 in Kirkuk. Um, uh, that's gone, hasn't it? I mean, the, the the Kurds have effectively established an independent presence there. They've taken Kirkuk. They say they're not they're not giving it back. I mean, that bit of national unity is is gone, is it not? Okay, uh, it's all started with the uh, June tenth when Mosul uh, was. Uh, uh, taken by the ISIL. And then they started coming south towards Kirkuk. Uh, many provinces, uh, the Arab populated provinces around Kirkuk, had fallen one after one. Uh, Riyadh and Hawija and Abbasi had all fallen uh, uh, to the hands of the ISIL uh, within uh, six hours. Uh, it was uh, then. Uh, Kirkuk was threatened. It, it was about to fall. And you know that uh, for the past 50 years, uh, there is a, a struggle between the central government and the Kurdish authority about Kirkuk. Uh, both uh, uh, parties uh, claim uh, Kirkuk to be of its own. So then it was uh, Tuesday night at uh, June 10th when uh, troops from the Peshmerga, Peshmerga is a well-organized uh, Kurdish troops, started to come inside Kirkuk. Uh, they made a ring around Kirkuk. Uh, ISIL, by that time, was only about five kilometers away from Kirkuk. They were in the industrial area near the city. Uh, OK, let me let me put those points to the people in the studio here a moment, Professor. Uh, I mean, th that, you know, it's, that's an accurate description, isn't it, of what, of what was happening there. But, I mean, the, the Kurdish area is, is it, you know, it's been semi-autonomous all the way from the o occupation. It's going to be, that, that's it, it's going to be completely independent, isn't it, from now on? Well, the, the Kurdish movement uh, is always aspiring for independence. Uh, they have a problem because the Turks and the Iranians have declared it a number of times that if they become an independent state, then they will be split between these two countries. So it is in the interest at the present moment of the Kurds to stay within, as if pretend to stay within Iraq. Nominally. Nominally there. The problem they have is even within the Kurdish movement, Talabani and Barzani, you have the two groups of the, of the Kurds. The Kirkuk, in theory, should belong to one group. They should be belonging to the Talabani, but actually the Barazani forces has gone there. But I don't think this is a permanent situation. It depends on how it's going to evolve in the next, say, couple of months. We could end up with a stalemate situation, but we could end up with some other changes. Depends how much the uh, neighbors, Iran and, and, and others, are going to interfere, what successes Maliki can have or not have. There is a, a possibility Baghdad will fall. On the other hand, the government is making all these noises that they are uh, recovering this area and that area. The facts on the ground does not bear that one, because when the army had run away, it's not going to be able to recover land when they were in their own bases. And what have. So it depends on how it's going to go. So as far as Kirkuk is concerned, I think it's a, this is an adjourned case. But certainly the Kurdish movement is putting pressure on Maliki to deal with the issues of the constitution, the oil, and Kirkuk. These are the, the outstanding matters. Mm -hmm. Paul, how do you read the, the situation of well, the Kurds? Well, it's interesting and regrettable, I think. The Kurds have, have chosen not to engage ISIS. They've just taken over Kirkuk, which has been their long historical aspiration, and they're going to sit there. I think it will be very hard to get them out. Um, 
who's going to take that city street by street against determined Kurdish resistance. At the very least, they'll, it would have to be bargained for in terms of control of the, of the oil revenues. Mm. But first of all, there's going to have to be some kind of decisive military struggle in, cent in central Iraq. And the critical factors here will be the Iranians, I think. Maybe American air power as well, in some, an interesting alliance. But the Iranian Revolutionary Guard <laughs> Corps are active, Soleimani, Supposedly, the master strategist is draw of, of Iran is drawing up plans for the, for the defense of um, Baghdad and, I guess, the, the counterattack. And all eyes will be on that for the next mm. two, three, four months, I think, mm. unless well, ISIS collapse quicker. Well we'll, well, we'll come back to those possibilities in a minute. But first, Chris, so in, Anne was saying you know, nobody could have foreseen that uh, Maliki would be such a divisive figure. But, I mean, divisiveness has been the name of the game, hasn't it, in the... In, the post-war Iraq. No. Uh, pre -war Iraq. Well, well, but I mean, I think it's important to say here that, that you know, obviously Tony Blair and others are trying to avoid this, um, this discussion, but that the, the sectarian, uh, the, the deep sectarian divide between Sunni and Shia in Iraq, although it's always existed, has only come to a, the point of violence, only come to the point of conflict during the period of the occupation. And Not this true. is something that, th 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 it's essentially true. You may be able to give some examples uh, previous, but, but in terms of actual bloodletting, it started when the Americans made the very conscious and explicit decision to use Shia against Sunni as a way of overcoming the, the, the thing that amazingly surprised them, which is that the uh, shock and awe was unpopular amongst the population that it was massacring. Um, and faced with the, the, the obvious reality that they couldn't stage elections in, at the end of 2003 and the beginnings of real resistance in 2004, they resorted to what the uh, colonial powers have always resorted to, which is divide and rule. And, and the, we are now um, experiencing the fallout from that, that terrible decision, I believe. Paul, you were disagreeing with well, that. Well, uh, for various reasons, I can point you to numerous instances in the 19th century when Wahhabis raided and destroyed Shia sh sh shrines just as ISIS are threatening to do now. So this has this been... Is before the construction yeah. of, of modern nation yeah, states, isn't it? But those dynamics have been there. and in, there's, the, 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 Iraq is in a fault line, across a fault line, between Sunni and Shia, the Turkish and the... Um, Iranian power struggle. So this, it's not accidental and it, and it is recurrent. I also disagree that um, the coalition was deliberately divisive. I was there. We would not take people as senior civil servants who we were trying to train up who made divisive statements. Anyone who said we're going to have domination of this country by the Shia was out and, and still more the, the Sunni. There, there was certainly a, an anxiety about Sunni rev revanchism, the former regime elements. And to some extent, sadly, that's not been completely wrong. A, a figure who's not been mentioned is al Duri, Saddam's right-hand man, active in the t retaking of Tikrit. So there is a kind of Sunni Ba'athist um, activist subversion which, which has gone on and is now apparent. Th this is tragic because it's made both both sides have made the others' suspicions of each other justified. Sunnis and Shia have, have frightened each other and will go on disgusting and terrifying each other until this is brought to an end. OK. Um, we're probably not going to resolve this now, no. but uh, Sabah, um, looking forward now, do you, do you see the prospect of, um, um, as, as Paul was raising there, he called it interesting that, that there might be other words, um, uh, of a, an Iranian operation on the ground and an American air operation? Well, the American air operation I don't see incoming because if the Americans do that, they will be asked, why are you not doing it in Syria? So they have a problem with that one. I think uh, uh, as far as Obama is concerned, he, he has no one with him. So he had to make these appropriate noises. As far as the Iranians are concerned, yes, they will interfere. They have interfered. They've advised for that. But uh, there is the problem with, with Diyala because now it's beginning to be difficult. They can go from Kut. That's, that's one of the, the options. They have Soleimani and all the other uh, issues. But you, you can see the difficulty because Maliki is now relying on volunteers. If you have the professional army going, what are you going to do with, with Dad's army people you know, coming into the, into the picture? So I think the interference of the outside is going to be there, but I think it's going to be limited. The way forward, I think, first of all... Well, come on to that. Sorry. Just on that question, Anne, uh, do, do you think that, uh, I mean, we see American 
we, we see American aircraft carriers moving um, into position. Uh, do you think the air power is going to be used? Um, it's actually a difficult one. I don't know. I, I don't think so either, to be honest. I think they will refrain from using force. Right now, it may be more a policy of just letting the enemies know that they're right at the border and they're ready to act if necessary. But I don't think they will intervene militarily. If they were really planning to do so, they probably would have done so by now. They're trying to see how things are evolving also on the ground. It depends on the situation, uh, how the situation will evolve in Baghdad. And uh, I think what is also increasingly concerning is the coordinated effort between the Iraqi security forces and the Iraqi Shia militias, along with the Iranian efforts like the increasing role of the Badr organization or the SIA Badr in the security forces. I've heard of, for example, Sunni residents being taken out by Shia militias inside of Baghdad and being detained. So you have an increasing uh, sectarian, sectarianization of the conflict that is already taking place inside of Baghdad. So even if ISIL doesn't make it to Baghdad, how will it translate in the longer term inside of Baghdad among the different communities is another issue as well. OK, well, we're going to have to leave it there because we've come to the end of the first half. But there's much more to say and we will be saying it in the second half of the programme. So do we join us after the break?